Hey, to all of you out there who are in middle school, high school, college, or who just consider yourself young at heart, and whether you're from Ozaki Congregational Church or somehow slightly connected to OCC or not at all, maybe you're somewhere completely different in all of cyberspace, to all of you out there, uh, happy Sunday once again. This, uh, for OCC, is Sunday number eight, eight Sundays in a row now, since we have had regular MP3 and confirmation class and other youth programs in person in the building at OCC. And I guess I'm just kind of wanting to check in with you. One of the things that we often do when we gather together as a, as a group in the youth room is we take a moment before we pray and we share joys and concerns. And uh, obviously now it's been eight Sundays since we've been able to do that with one another. And I've honestly heard very, very little in terms of uh, texts, emails, social media, messaging, whatever, from most of you. So I just want to take a moment here right up front before we dive into anything else to say that if you have a joy or a concern in your life, something that uh, you're thankful for, or something that is weighing on your heart and mind and, and you would like uh, folks to be praying for, or just something you'd like me to be aware of that's going on in your life, please don't, don't hesitate to reach out to me. If you're a regular participant at OCC on, on any level, uh, you you know how to get in touch with me. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to put my cell phone number out here on, on YouTube for all of the wide world to see. Uh, but those of you who are connected to OCC, you've got that number. You can text me. You can call me. You've also got my email address and my various social media uh, channels. So, uh, you know, somehow or another, let me know. Uh, it'd be good to hear from you and just see how you're holding up during all of this remote learning, online schoolwork, and everything else. Okay, so today is Sunday, May 10th, and it's a, kind of a triply special Sunday, because today is the Sunday immediately following Teacher Appreciation Week. Yeah, <clears throat> believe me, um, I know some teachers. And uh, the ones that I know are no more thrilled with online classes than you are. And I know the, those of you that I have heard from on this, it is like unanimous that you guys don't like online classes. You would much rather be physically at school with your friends in classrooms, learning from teachers face to face. And I'm here to tell you that among the teachers I know, they're in complete agreement with you. They would much rather be able to do it that way. And it's much more challenging for teachers to teach online when they're accustomed and they're trained to teach in person or face to face. So, you know, if you haven't yet uh, said a, just a nice, kind, considerate word of thanks, to your teachers, uh, maybe you might want to do that sometime this coming week because they're under a good deal of stress and strain right now too, just as you are. And, and just as you're a little maybe antsy or impatient or frustrated or annoyed by online learning, well, they're kind of feeling similarly about online teaching. So say something kind and thoughtful to your teachers this coming week. Why else is today special? Well, today is also the Sunday that falls right in the kind of in the middle of Nurses Appreciation Week. And as you all know, if you've watched any amount of news coverage of the COVID-19 crisis at all, you know that uh, our nurses, doctors, aides, orderlies, medical workers in general, they are doing just heroic work around the country 
trying to care for some very, very sick folks. And by the way, while so many folks are coming into hospitals with, with COVID-19 situations, there still are regular medical situations too. People are still having heart attacks. People are still coming down with illnesses that are not COVID-19. There's still other medical work to be done. So man, if, if you have a nurse or any other kind of medical worker in your life, maybe reach out to them this week too and offer just a, a word of thanks, a word of admiration. Let them know that you recognize what uh, strain the medical system in our country has been under over these last couple of months. And just let them know that you're appreciative of all that they're doing. All right, so that's two things. Uh, Teacher Appreciation Week, Nurses Appreciation Week, but of course, there's one more sort of layer of specialness to today, and that is that today is Mother's Day. And so we're going to take a little break today from some of what we normally do. Today, we're not going to focus on this week in Christian history or the word of the day or the quote of the day. We can get back to that stuff next week. Today, though, I do want to take a moment and test your knowledge with a little bit of Mother's Day trivia. So here we go. Uh, There will be a total of seven questions, and feel free to text me or whatever and let me know how many out of seven you got. Who knows? Maybe you will be the Mother's Day trivia champion of our group. So here's here's question number one, and I suppose this is like a closest guess wins question. In the United States, Mother's Day was first celebrated in what year? I'll give you just about 10 seconds here to settle on your answer, your guess. You can jot it down on a piece of scrap paper. Pause the video if you need to. All right. So the answer is 1908. So yeah, like a century plus 12 years or so ago. Um, pretty remarkable. Yeah, it's, uh, it was founded by Anna Jarvis, who simply wanted to do something to honor her mom and then wanted it to kind of become more of a, a widespread national thing. And Anna Jarvis, by the way, was uh, an active member of her Methodist church at the time. So shout out to Methodists. Okay, Uh, true or false? This is question number two. True or false? Anna Jarvis sought to initiate Mother's Day in 1908 in Grafton. Yeah, true or false? In Grafton. Grafton. That's basically the birthplace of Mother's Day. True or false? Again, if you need to pause the video here because you want a moment to think, that's totally okay. But here the answer is true. Yeah, true. Except it was Grafton, West Virginia. Okay, yeah, a little bit of a sidestep there for you, but yes, Uh, Anna Jarvis lived in the town of Grafton, West Virginia, not Grafton, Wisconsin, where OCC is located. But yes, you can say it was true that Mother's Day began in Grafton. Uh, By the way, uh, Congress was initially uh, resistant to the idea of declaring Mother's Day a national holiday In fact, some of the senators reportedly joked, and this is not not like brilliant political rhetoric on the part of those senators, but there was a joke going around that if they were to pass Mother's Day, then they would have to pass Mother-in-Law's Day, and they sure didn't want to do that. None of them wanted to pass a Mother-in-Law's Day, so they resisted Mother's Day. All right, Uh, question number three, though, in what year... Did it finally come about that Mother's Day was celebrated in all of the United States? Not just in West Virginia, where it began, but in all of the United States. 
All right, the answer is 1911. Yeah, just three years after it began. So it did spread fairly quickly. In fact, it was celebrated in all of those states before Congress got around to actually declaring it a national holiday. All right, which U.S. president, this is question number four, which U.S. president finally declared Mother's Day a national holiday and, by the way, pegged it on the second Sunday of May, where it is even today? So which U.S. president was that? I know presidents are hard, especially if you're going back a ways. But again, pause if you need another moment, but I'll reveal that the answer is Woodrow Wilson. And he actually made that declaration in 1914, back way back around the beginning time of the World War I. Woodrow Wilson was the guy. All right, question number five. About what year did Hallmark cards begin cropping up and being widely sold to honor Mother's Day? All right. On this one, the answer is a little squishy, but uh, we know that it was sometime in the early 20s, 1920s. It's a little unclear whether it was 1922, 1923, but kind of somewhere in that range. All right. So if you guessed 1920, 21, 22, 23, 24, even 25, uh, consider yourself a, a winner or to be correct on that. All right. Question number six. Which flower, what type of flower, was originally associated with Mother's Day starting in the mid-1920s and still is considered the traditional Mother's Day flower even today. What type of flower? And the answer is carnations. Yeah, carnations are the typical Mother's Day flower. And Seventh and final question of our Mother's Day trivia. Which spelling is correct for Mother's Day? Should it be M-O-T-H-E-R apostrophe S, as in singular mother, one Mother's Day? Or should it be M-O-T-H-E-R-S apostrophe, meaning Mother's Day as in all Mother's Day, a day for all mothers, which is correct. And the answer is the first one. Yeah, I, I was actually kind of surprised by that myself. The correct spelling for Mother's Day is M-O-T-H-E-R apostrophe S. And Anna Harris, uh, sorry, Anna Jarvis, the woman way back in 1908 who started Mother's Day in Grafton, West Virginia, she actually talked and wrote a little bit about why she thought that was an important distinction, because she thought Mother's Day should be a day for each individual to celebrate and thank their individual mother that it should be seen by each person as their specific mother's day, not as a generic day for all moms all over the world. Uh, so that was Anna Jarvis's preference, and whatever your English teacher may say about it, that's the way she wanted her day, her Mother's Day creation, to be spelled. So those are the answers. Again, you might have gotten zero right, you might have gotten seven right, or somewhere in between, and feel free to let me know, text me or email me or, or message me or something, and uh, we'll see who did well on that. So I want to take a moment or two and talk about a, 
some memories of my mom, but in order to do that, I need to walk 2.2 miles. Are you ready? All right, let's go. On this Mother's Day, I naturally think lovingly and gratefully about the memory of my mom. She died in December of 2011. Uh, it was her wish to be cremated, and so of course I made sure that that's exactly what happened. But I held on to her ashes from December of 2011 until Mother's Day of 2012, five months later, and her ashes were placed right on the left side of this boulder, this marker stone, uh, near the birch grove at North Shore Congregational Church here in Fox Point. Her ashes are right there, sort of to the left of and beneath the word earth. My mom was born in 1934. I'm her only child, and some of you may know that a a stereotype sometimes attached to only children is that we tend to be a little bit self-centered. So my mom for a good chunk of my childhood, honestly even into my adulthood, used to sometimes say, Rob, the world does not revolve around you. That was her way of reminding me that my wants, my desires, my preferences shouldn't govern everything that there were a lot of other people and a lot of other interests that should be weighed in also. My mom was a teacher by profession. She spent a good chunk of her life working with uh, lower elementary grades as well as kindergarten and preschool, both in public schools and with the YMCA. She loved kids. She was, I think, sort of the ultimate people person. You know, lots of people say, well, I'm a people person. And yeah, that's that's all fine and good, but I think my mom was kind of the ultimate people person. She was incredibly uh, loving, empathetic, uh, really genuinely caring, cheerful almost every single day of her life, almost never grouchy even when she herself was sick or had something on her mind that was causing her to have a pretty bad day, she still was far more interested in talking about you and what was going on with your day. She was pretty incredible that way. In fact, if I had to pick sort of a metaphor or a story to describe her, I would point to that, that classic children's book by Shel Silverstein entitled The Giving Tree. As a young kid, I used to love, you know, Curious George and all the Dr. Seuss books and all of that, but she introduced me to that book, The Giving Tree, also. And, boy, if you're not familiar with it, 
check it out either online or you know you can buy it at a bookstore or on Amazon but I'm pretty sure you can even find it on YouTube just being read to you by somebody it's an amazing story about self-sacrifice for the benefit of other people and that really sums up a lot of what I remember about my mom she was always willing to put other people first or to focus more on the needs of other people than on her own like I said she was a teacher by profession talk about a tie-in right because here we are it's Mother's Day and I'm talking about my mom it's Teachers Appreciation Week and I'm talking about a teacher and my mom's mom was a nurse and yeah we're also in nurses appreciation week so it's really kind of an amazing tie-in when you think about it but man I have just such wonderful memories of my mom she passed away as I said in December of 2011 from lung cancer despite the fact that she had given up smoking cold turkey well before she got pregnant with me so it is kind of a mystery exactly how she managed to get lung cancer she had very little warning uh, she found out about the possibility of tumors in her lungs on Halloween of 2011 and it took less than a month to get a biopsy and a full diagnosis and a prognosis which was quite grim and she ended up passing away the very next month in December but I miss her every day and uh, certainly she is a, a big part of who I am and what she taught me is a big part of what I've become. You know, as important as our biological mothers are, in our lives and they surely are um, it's kind of interesting that we don't that often think of God as our mother historically a lot of the names and titles that have been used to describe God have been kind of masculine kind of male oriented uh, here's a kind of a word cloud I'll put up on the screen for you and you can you can pick out some of the examples of this. Um, king is obviously male. Lord, ruler, shepherd, obviously father. You know, there's quite a few of these titles for God that have traditionally or historically been thought of as male titles. Um, but we know that God exists beyond gender, that God is as much female as male, that really God is spirit, as is taught in the Gospels. Uh, Jesus himself said, God is spirit, and we shall worship him in spirit and in truth. And so to think of God as simply male is giving ourselves kind of an incomplete understanding of who and what God is and how God relates to each of us uh, as an intimate caregiver for us. Uh, I thought I would share with you a passage, a short passage from the book of Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs is a, an interesting book of wisdom. And actually in the Old Testament, wisdom is sometimes almost um, written about as though wisdom were an intelligent entity. In fact, the Hebrew word is chakma, C-H-O-K-M-A-H. -H. But in Greek, the word for wisdom is Sophia. And I bet some of you maybe know someone, uh, a classmate of yours at school or something, maybe a teammate even, who is named Sophia. Uh, yeah, it's a semi-common name for girls and women and um, yeah it is the Greek word meaning wisdom sometimes uh, people 
roughly equate the Old Testament's Sophia with the New Testament's Holy Spirit. So the idea of God as our comforter, for example, has some resonance, some kind of connection in a lot of theologians' minds with the Old Testament idea of divine wisdom being written about as Sophia. So this passage is from Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 to 23, and I'll put it up on the screen. Like I say, it's not at all long, and we're going to read it twice today. First, in the New Revised Standard Version, it says this. My child, keep your father's commandment, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them upon your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching a light, and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. Now, that might sound a little Bible-ish to you. Uh, so we'll go to Eugene Peterson's The Message. As a lot of you know, uh, The Message is a more modern way of phrasing the ideas that are in the Bible. And The Message version says this, that renders that same passage I just read this way. Good friend. Follow your father's good advice. Don't wander off from your mother's teachings. Wrap yourself in them from head to foot. Wear them like a scarf around your neck. Wherever you walk, they'll guide you. Whenever you rest, they'll guard you. When you wake up, they'll tell you what's next. For sound advice is a beacon. Good teaching is a light. Moral discipline is a life path. So I thought I'd share that passage with you, at least in part, because it sort of uh, holds the Father's commandment and the Mother's teaching on pretty much even ground and advises us to, to live our lives according to both, a Father's commandments and a Mother's teachings. And God certainly uh, kind of connects with us on both of those lanes, right? God is, in a sense, our Father. Jesus himself commonly called God Abba, which in most of our Bibles is rendered as Father, but could really maybe more accurately be rendered as Daddy. Very intimate, very familiar. So, yes, God is our Father, but God is also, in a very real sense, our mother. In fact, uh, Julian of Norwich, who is a figure from church history going back hundreds of years, Julian of Norwich said this, Just as God is truly our Father, so also God is truly our mother. So when you think about the qualities you associate with your father and how those qualities may be parallel in some ways with God's qualities, how God's fatherly qualities are in some small way reflected in your own biological father, maybe we can do the same with regard to God's motherly qualities and how they are in some small way reflected in our biological mothers on this Mother's Day. And so we close today, as we often do, with some spiritual growth targets for you. And uh, here they are, two of them today. First, spend five minutes today. I'm not asking you to do a ton, but take five minutes Go sit outside or sit in your room or find a quiet place, five minutes, and think about how God is 
truly not just your heavenly father, but also your heavenly mother. And then, secondly, do something nice for your mom today. Uh, I realize these are different times, and uh, you're not out and about. Maybe your family tradition is to take mom out to brunch after church. And that's a great Mother's Day tradition. But obviously that isn't happening this year, not on Mother's Day 2020, because the restaurants are by and large closed except for takeout. And it's best to just maintain your social distancing or physical distancing. But still, you can do something nice for your mom. Find some way to express your gratitude, your admiration, your appreciation to your mom today. This is Mother's Day. And as Anna Jarvis said when she created the holiday, when she initiated it in 1908 in Grafton, Wisconsin, she wanted it to be spelled apostrophe S, not S apostrophe, because she wanted it to be a day when each individual, that means you, when you as an individual remember and honor and give gratitude to your own specific mother, not just to motherhood in general as a category of people, but to your own specific mother. All right, before we totally wrap up today, let's bow our heads for a quick word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we do give you thanks today. Even at a time of national and global crisis, we, we find things for which to be thankful. And today, maybe at the top of our minds, are three groups of people. Yes, we're, we're grateful for teachers, O oh Lord. Maybe especially at this time when teaching is a new and difficult challenge, we are grateful for the dedication, for the creativity, for the enthusiasm of teachers in taking on this challenge and continuing to help us learn even in these difficult times. We're so grateful, O oh God, for nurses and for all frontline medical workers. They are the folks that are perhaps at greatest risk right now because they're treating so many patients that have this incredibly contagious, transmissible disease. They're risking their own health. They're risking the, the health of their own family members so that they can provide compassionate and expert care to those that need it most. And so, Lord, we are grateful for all of the medical workers who are part of our society. And of course, Lord, we are grateful for mothers. And specifically, I hope that each and every person within the sound of my voice here over cyberspace takes a moment today to think about their own mother, to be appreciative and to show thankfulness and gratitude to their own specific mother, and to ponder how you, O oh God, are not only our Heavenly Father, but also, too, are our Heavenly Mother. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a reminder, uh, as I said at the top of the video, let me just bring it back around full circle. We haven't had an opportunity to get together face-to-face -to -face in eight Sundays, and that includes not having the opportunity to share joys and concerns. So again, I hope you will not hesitate to reach out to me if you have something in your life that you would like to share, either a joy, a triumph, a victory, something to be celebrated, or perhaps some care or concern that is weighing on your heart and your mind. Um, if you'd like to share that with me, please zip me a text, send me an email, hit me up on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Um, I, I'd love to hear from you. Meanwhile, I hope that you're doing at least okay during this continued time of online learning. To college folks out there who may not yet be totally done with exams, and it depends on the university, I, I know some of you are already done, 
and some may still be in the midst of exam stress. So to those of you who are still in it, the best of luck to you. Don't forget that God's love doesn't depend on your GPA. Whether you get straight A's or straight D's or anything in between, God loves you infinitely, eternally, and unconditionally. Don't forget that. Do your best, of course, but always remember that God's love is a bedrock that does not change depending on your academic performance. And so until next time, I'll sign off here and simply wish God's blessings upon your life in the days to come. Take care.